Thank you for joining us today. My name is Phil Ledent, and I'm the Executive Director here at the Masonry Institute of Michigan. Uh, today we'll have a brief video on our guide for placing control joints in concrete masonry unit wall construction. Um, our guide is divided into a few different sections, uh, FAQs, we have a, our guide as well as a calculator, and some example elevations that we'll go through. Some of the FAQs that we typically get are what are masonry control joints? MCMA has a few tech notes, tech notes 10-2 through 10-4, which cover the different types of control joints in concrete masonry walls. Tech 10-2D uh, covers the empirical method, Tech 10-3 covers the alternative engineered method, and Tech 10-4 covers crack control for concrete brick and other concrete masonry veneers. I do want to mention that at MIM, we do have a full one hour lunch and learn presentation dedicated to movement control for CME walls that is available for learning credits as well. Um, the second FAQ that we get quite frequently is whether or not um, CMU veneers require horizontal joint reinforcement. If you go through Tech 10-4, um, it does recommend that CMU veneers do have that horizontal joint reinforcement um, due to the net effect of shrinkage because it is a cement-based unit. And so typically we'll see that horizontal joint reinforcement at a typical spacing of about 16 inches on center in a CMU veneer type system. But lastly, who's responsible uh, for locating masonry movement joints on the drawings? This point I, I like to mention because in the TMS document, which is TMS 602, it says specifically that the architect or engineer has to locate not only the type, but also the location of movement joints on the project drawings. And as you'll see in this presentation and in our full one hour presentation, um, the type does have impacts on things like fire rating, as well as structural implications. Uh, and the location is really up to the architect or engineer to decide um, since movement is really in their responsibility. So our control joint guide, we have it broken up into the two sections that uh, MCMA has. We have options two and three, which cover, cover the empirical method, option four, which covers the engineered method, and at the top we have option one, which covers CMU veneers. Um, as noted here in parentheses, we have wire at 16 inches on center. Um, it is worth noting that MCMA recently updated their tech note, and so for half high units, so if they're four inch high units, the wire is required at 12 inches on center, and not the 16 inches on center we're used to seeing. And if we think about a block in a wall and a half high block, um, we can see that there's gonna be essentially double the mortar in that bed joint, um, which is gonna result in a lot more shrinkage in that wall. And so if we space that wire out at 16 inches on center, we do have a lot more shrinkage potential, uh, which could result in cracking. For the engineered method, I just wanted to briefly note that it does require a little more in-depth knowledge uh, because you have to select a crack control coefficient of either 0.001 or 0 0.0015, and NCMA does allow linear interpolation for those as well. Uh, so our, the way our guide is broken down is we have our straight wall length here in the leftmost column. We have what our corner offset is permitted to be based on the NCMA tech notes. And then we have two options, either reinforced openings or unreinforced openings, as well as hyperlinks to the tech notes. And over here on the left, you can see these options are hyperlinks that will go to our wall elevations um, that we have shown in a few slides here. So if we talk about our reinforced wall opening, is what, which is what we typically recommend here at MIM, there's a lot of benefits that come along with it. Um, if we have a reinforced wall opening, so we're gonna move our control joints off of the opening, not the, we won't get the corners like we're used to seeing, um, we're gonna have inherent arching action because that joint is gonna be located far enough away that it's not going to break up that arching, at, arching action. Um, so we're going to be able to design that lintel for much less load because we're only designing for that area in that purple triangle. We're going to have fewer control joints because we're not locating them at every single opening. We're spacing them off of the opening. We don't have a slip plane required. So if we were to have a joint located at the corner of our opening, um, typically we're going to have to provide a slip plane so that we're going to accommodate that movement. And with this type of detail, we do not have that slip plane required. <clears throat> um, there's no maintenance if we go with a CMU type lintel. Um, because we're not painting the bottom of it, obviously, like a steel lintel we would be, so there's no maintenance on it. Uh, no cutting and anchoring of soaps, uh, like we would have required on a steel lintel. There's no lead time, and there's no delays. So a lot of jobs recently that have specified steel lintels um, have had some issues with lead time, causing delays on the job site, and we're able to actually value engineer the lintels and make them out of concrete masonry units, saving time on the project. 
Um, unreinforced openings, so like we wouldn't typically recommend anymore, but for smaller type openings, you can see we're going to have one joint on one side of the opening. As we get into larger type openings, we're going to have one on each side. And you can see these diagrams are out of that NCMA tech note um, that show the horizontal joint reinforcement at those corners uh, because of some of the stress concentration. Also, it's worth noting down in the tech note that if we have uh, something shown like in figure 2B, if we have a slip plane on the bottom of that lintel on both sides, oops, and we have that control joint, then this lintel and the masonry above it is pretty unsupported because we don't, it's not supported vertically at the bearing elevation, and it's not supported horizontally at the control joint because we're accommodating that movement. Um, and so because it's not laterally supported, we have to provide joints, which they have shown in the tech note, um, in diagrams 3A, D, E, F, H, and I which I have shown on this screen. So in Michigan, you see a lot of this formed paper joint, which we call the Michigan control joint because it is so common here in Michigan. It is worth noting that it's four hour fire rated. Um, so that's good. And additionally, because we're filling the ears of the block with that grout, it provides some shear key action. So we have load path continuity and each panel is supported um, by the adjacent panel. Um, preformed gaskets can provide some load transfer, but we'd have to do some research to see what the load transfer capability is there. We do have options to continue horizontal joint reinforcement or horizontal bond beams through the wall as well. Um, but we would have to be bond one of them to allow that movement. What happens if we don't do that? Well, I got some pictures here on the right that we can see where one wall panel is deflecting a couple inches out of plane relative to the one next to it. Um, obviously, this is bad, so don't do that. Um, do what we have, do what we typically do, and uh, just show a Michigan masonry control joint on your drawings for most conditions. Um, we do have a control joint calculator available on our website, so I can briefly show that. So our website, uh, masonryinfo.org, if you come on here at the bottom of the homepage, we have calculators that we have available. Um, so CMU CJ spacing is one of them. And if you click on it, it's going to download our Excel sheet, um, which I'll open up here. Uh, so if we hit enable editing, at the bottom you'll notice we have tabs for 8-inch high CMU, 4-inch high or half high CMU, and CMU veneer. And so it's pretty simple to use. The only inputs required from a designer are the orange cells. Um, so for instance, for full height, eight inch high CMU, maybe you have a 20 foot tall wall, put that 20 foot and zero inches. You have the option of either the empirical or engineered method. Um, if you choose empirical, then the crack control coefficient will not matter. It will just calculate your straight wall length and your corner offset. If you select it, the engineered method, you have the option of selecting your crack control coefficient of either 0.001 4.0015, and that will affect your wall length as well as your corner length down here. I do have the applicable tables from uh, the tech note available here, so we can see that for normal height CMU, um, nine gauge horizontal joint reinforcement, our maximum spacing would be 16 inches on the center. As I noted for half high units, the table out of NCMA's tech note, we're at 12 inches on center. So very important to keep that in mind. We do get a lot of calls about half high units cracking. Um, and NCMA has updated their tech note for that 12 inch spacing. For ZMU veneers, uh, very similar. We just input what our wall height is and it's going to calculate out your straight wall length as well as your corner offset. Um, as noted in the tech note, our corner offset, we're typically going to want to put it within four inches of an outside corner. Um, so this is pretty typically just going to default to four inches there. Um, so this tool is available on our website. <clears throat> Um, and in our full presentation, we do a, go through some wall elevations. So for instance, this would be a CMU veneer elevation. Um, and in, this, in our elevations, we will show you uh, what the spacing is in reality based on this fictitious wall, as well as what the limits are. So one and a half times the height or 20 foot max for this veneer system. Um, we notate slip planes if they're required. Um, and we have the openings if we're greater than six foot or less than six. I do note here that this is based on support conditions. So if we have a lintel that's anchored back to maybe a load bearing backup, we'll have to take that into account when we're locating our control joints as well, um, as opposed to a loose lintel type of construction. For a reinforced opening, which is what we typically recommend, you can see here that our jam reinforcement continues up through both sides of the opening, pardon my terrible drawing here. Um, and then we're just going to extend our lintel 12 inches on each side past that jam reinforcement. We'll have our horizontal joint reinforcement below the opening that goes from control joint to control joint. 
And this is going to eliminate a lot of the cracking that we see at the corners of openings in masonry construction. We do have elevations shown for unreinforced openings, uh, which we wouldn't typically recommend, but these are going to require that slip plane like I had mentioned before, and they'll be located at the corner of these openings. Like I've noted at the bottom here too, so this is for full height units, so we're at 16 inches on center maximum spacing. And I do want to point out that I, these elevations were developed using Masonry IQ, uh, which is a Revit add-in that we have available, available here in Michigan. Um, really nice tool to use. If you're interested in it, please reach out. Uh, lastly, we have the empirical method for um, half high units and pretty much the same except down here at the bottom, 12 inches on center. Really important to remember. You know, we want to avoid cracking those half high units. So we're going to go with a 12 inch maximum on center spacing for that horizontal joint reinforcement. Unreinforced opening, uh, very similar uh, four inch compared to eight inch units. Lastly, um, I have an engineered methods. So typically where we see this used is where the empirical method kind of breaks down. So where we'd have maybe a wainscoat in a pre-engineered metal building, so maybe a four foot eight height of that wall, uh, typically we'd be limited to an aspect ratio of 1.5. With the engineered method, we're able to get that aspect ratio up to either two or two and a half, depending on the crack control coefficients. So we're able to space those joints out maybe a little bit further to nine foot four or 11 foot four. Um, so kind of nice being able to use that. Also in the engineered method, there's an option where if we provide some additional horizontal uh, reinforcement, whether it be bond beams um, or ladder type reinforcement, we can actually eliminate all the control joints. So for this fictitious wall, which is four foot eight high, if we provide three bond beams in that wall, we actually have sufficient reinforcement that we do not need any control joints at all. Um, so this would be a really nice application of the engineered method to get rid of all of those control joints. And if you have questions about that, please feel free to reach out. Our contact information uh, we have shown here, uh, masonryinfo.org, or give us a call or send me an email at phil at masonryinfo.org, and we'd be happy to help you on your projects. Thank you again for your time. I really appreciate it.